Okay, big finish. Last time on why educational games should be awesome, we talked about the obstacles to meaningful concept chain, to deeply learning, to internalizing new ideas, to better understanding new theories of how the world works. So now we get to talk about how to overcome those obstacles, how to get people to internalize new ideas, why games are good at helping people internalize new ideas and develop better understanding. Let's start by talking about how people evaluate theories, how they decide between possible explanations for an event. One of the better theories about how people decide why something happened is called inference to the best explanation, or IBE. It says people judge explanations based on a number of different criteria, how accurately it fits the information you have, how many assumptions it makes, how consistent it is with other theories, etc. And that's neat and fits with how people reason pretty well, but the important bit is it also talks about when people will change their theory. Based on this kind of evaluation, IBE says that for people to make a significant conceptual change, they must become dissatisfied with the current theory and have an alternative that is available, intelligible, fruitful, and plausible. In order for someone to meaningfully change their idea, they have to see the current theory as problematic. This usually involves like new information it can't explain or some other downside. They have to know an alternative exists. People can't pick something they don't know is an option. The alternative has to be intelligible. They have to be able to understand the alternative. It doesn't explain things better if you don't understand how it explains it. The alternative has to be fruitful. It has to be useful somehow. Finally, it has to be plausible. This usually means it fits with other things the person knows. Like, a wizard did it, may be available and intelligible, but it doesn't seem like a plausible explanation. And remember, the new theory has to be all of these things, has to meet all of these criteria from the perspective of someone holding the current theory. This is part of why knowing your audience is so important for education or persuasion. Okay, so that's a pretty good standard for change, and it seems to line up pretty well with what we see people do. Now let's take a step back from the literature and consider what it means for the classroom. So say you have students with a less accurate, naive theory, and you want to help them adopt a better theory. How do you help that theory meet these standards? These two are pretty straightforward. Basically you just like, tell them the alternative, and you explain it well. However, you'll notice that does nothing to address these other three. Now remember when we talked about instructional styles? How traditional instruction, you just send out information, and it's good for getting students to memorize it, but not for fostering deeper understanding? This model addresses part of why that is. On the other hand, the constructivist, the guided discovery model, was good at fostering deep understanding. That would mean it's better at meeting these standards. Why is that? To get a handle on this, let's look at a specific form of guided discovery called the learning cycle and how it meets this standard. The learning cycle has three stages. First, we have exploration, where students explore a new idea with little guidance, follow their own interests, and find patterns on their own. Coming back to the motivational pieces, we've got a lot of agency and competence, that they're in control, that they're figuring things out for themselves. But for concept change, the important part is it also lets students raise questions and recognize problems that can't be resolved by prior ways of thinking. So this directly addresses making them dissatisfied with their current theory while keeping engagement really high. And you can see how this is a constructivist approach rather than the transmissive approach. For a transmissive approach, you just tell them that it's wrong. Whereas here, you're working with them to help them understand why it's wrong, rather than attacking their beliefs. Now the next stage of the learning cycle is term introduction, where the instructor helps the students make sense of what they've discovered, linking terms to patterns and introducing interpretations that they may not have considered due to their preconceptions. So this is really the guided part of guided discovery, helping the students make sense of what they've found and find solutions to the problems they've uncovered. So this is where we're gonna address making the alternative available and intelligible by explaining it to the students. And since this is coming after exploration, they're actually motivated to consider the alternative rather than just defending their current theory. The final stage of the learning cycle is concept application, where they then take these new ideas and apply them concretely to problems, explore the boundaries of those ideas, explore how it relates to other ideas, compare it with their original ideas, see how it generalizes to new contexts, see how it can be applied to other problems. And this really helps them develop that understanding of those ideas. It also hits those last two criteria. By looking at how they can apply it, they actually see how it's fruitful. And by exploring how it relates to other ideas, they see how it's plausible. And it demonstrates how it has value personally to them, rather than some external, because it's on the test, or because it's right. 
even if it is. Okay, so having walked through the learning cycle, as one example of a constructivist guided discovery approach, we can see now how it's not just that it's more motivating and engaging, but it's really engaging in a way that supports meaningful concept change. And as we talked about last time, that kind of change is really hard, which is what makes these approaches really striking when you see them be effective. Okay, but what does all of this concept change stuff mean for game? It's very similar to the implications for instructional style but much more exciting. Because now we're not just talking about education, we're talking about the implications for games as an art form. We're talking about how games are uniquely equipped to help change the way you think about the world. And I want to talk about one way in particular that games are really well suited for this. A particular advantage games have over traditional education in addressing these three criteria. In making students dissatisfied with their current idea and showing the new idea is fruitful and plausible. When you're in a game, when you're in that designed world, when you're inside the magic circle, you accept the rules of that game, or most people do. You don't object to how a checker moves or that there's magic and dishonored. It's part of the game. Now remember the first step of the learning cycle is exploration. You give students a chance to find problems with their current theory. Normally you have to make people dissatisfied with their current theory before they'll even consider an alternative. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But in a game, you can take that alternative and define it as part of how the world works. And if the game is otherwise engaging, that incentivizes them accepting it even more so they can participate in that game. And beyond that, you can not just define that as part of how the world works, but you can set up the world so that, that alternative is used to solve problems. That it demonstrates the value of that alternative. That it shows how that alternative is useful. For example, you can make a rocketry game where having the sun at the center makes it easier to navigate. You can make a city building game where growth makes the city successful or where sustainability does. You can make an evolution game where you have to adapt across generations in order to survive. The really cool part is rather than having to address these separately, having to make someone dissatisfied, then pitch them the alternative, then show how it's fruitful. You can jump in and sort of do them all at the same time. You can say up front, this is how it works because this is the rules of the game. And because it's within the context of that game, they'll accept it and they'll start applying it there and demonstrating how it's fruitful. And seeing how it's useful to them can make them dissatisfied with the current theory. The constructed artificial nature of the game makes it easier to sort of bypass these normal biases against change and jump right into showing how you can apply these ideas. And at the same time, the interactivity, that personal relevance and sense of agency makes it engaging in a way that other media are not. Again, I'm really excited about this in terms of the potential for education, but think about it for other areas. Look at how like Rust helps people better understand race, how it helps them explore another perspective in a more personal but less threatening way. It can be so powerful. The hurdle for really leveraging this last bit is of course plausibility. If you want them to transfer what they've learned in the game to the real world, you have to scaffold that transfer. You have to build the clear parallels between how the world works and how the game works so they can see how it would apply there. If nothing in the game works like the real world, why would they expect something that works in the game to work in the real world? If you're making an education game, you need to be clear about what corresponds to the real world and what's accurate and what's been altered. Okay, that's pretty much all of it. In summary, games allow players to control their own experience, to focus on what's relevant to them and retain a sense of control even as they move through a world that's defined by a designer. This allows them to convey information in a way that's highly motivating, very engaging, and personally relevant. At the same time, this kind of designed experience is also well suited to fostering meaningful conceptual change, which is traditionally very hard to achieve, but absolutely essential for deeply understanding many topics. And that's why educational games should be awesome. Only more of them were, right? Thank you.